The characteristics of UFO propulsion, as reported by observers, indicates that no propellant is ejected in the opposite direction. I take it at face value, then, that the laws of motion, as understood and defined by Newton, can be violated by a suitable arrangement of hardware. While there is, as yet, no violation in any well-known experiment, we have only a few hundred years of practical experience. Our belief in the conservation laws is then buoyed by the sum of our experience and deflated by contrary reports in the UFO genre. The conservation laws should therefore not as yet be taken as written in stone. The chief characteristics of UFO propulsion are the absence of propellant thrown in a direction opposite to the acceleration, acceleration rates of greater than 100 g's, the absence of sonic booms, intense magnetic fields, gravitational and inertial effects, a transformer type of humming sound in the low register at near rest, increasing to higher registers during acceleration a preference for acceleration along the axis of symmetry, presence of glowing plasma around the vehicle during high-performance maneuvers. My present view is that a rotating part of the vehicle at the rim creates a centrifugal force in the plane of rotation that is then redirected out of the plane of rotation, resulting in accelerations of 100 g's and more. Rough calculations show that such force is easily generated in a rapidly rotating wheel of sufficient mass and that the material needed to contain this force is presently available to us. So there can be no doubt that such force, and more, would be attainable by extraterrestrials. The issue then is to redirect that force in non-compliance with the law of conservation of linear momentum. I propose to do this with an intense asymmetric magnetic field operating on neutrons in the rotating mass. A different interpretation of inertia is necessary. I assign the phenomena of inertia to the finite transmission velocity of information in the gravitational field. We can then imagine that the spherical gravitational field around any particle representing its mass, cannot respond instantaneously to the acceleration of the particle itself. The field lags behind while the signal of acceleration is in transit to any point in that field. This results in an ellipsoidal elongation of the field under acceleration, which returns to the normal spherical shape when the acceleration ceases. The field so distorted represents a diminished probability that the central particle will continue in the direction of acceleration. That is, the distortion always opposes the acceleration. Inertia is then the interaction of a particle with its own field, which contributes to the net probability of acceleration in any given direction along with all other fields emanating from all other particles, which composite to determine the actual direction of motion. We can then imagine that the fields of particles in a rotating wheel have ellipsoidal fields whose axes all point outward away from the axis of rotation of the wheel and all lying in the plane of rotation of the wheel. All relevant vectors cancel and the rotating wheel obeys conservation of linear momentum as is commonly observed. Next, we postulate an all-pervasive Euclidean field through which all particles move and have that a local expansion or compression of this field is the positive and negative charge of the electromagnetic field, which is, in fact, that same Euclidean field. This field must react to changes in the inertial fields of the particles that move through it. If it does not interact in some fashion with the inertial fields, it cannot be said to exist relative to them. To exist is to interact. Therefore, I propose that a positive and negative charge begins to form over the two foci of the ellipsoidal field formed when the neutral particle 
is radially accelerated by way of the centripetal force generated in a rotating wheel. We can now operate on these protocharges with an asymmetric magnetic field, causing one to move away from the magnetic pole in the charge that is compliant with the right-hand rule, and toward the magnetic pole in the charge forced to move in opposition to the right-hand rule. If the particle is a neutron, the extent of charge separation due to radial acceleration will not cause a decay of the neutron, but rather only a displacement of the axis of its ellipsoidal inertial field out of the plane of rotation of the wheel. There is then a net uncancelled vector along the axis of wheel rotation that would cause the vehicle to accelerate along that same axis of wheel rotation. Because the rotating wheel is a source of acceleration, we would expect it to be as massive as possible and the rest of the ship to be as light as possible to afford the least resistance to acceleration of the ship as a whole. We might also hypothesize that virtual particles form near the two foci of the accelerated ellipsoidal field, with one focus favoring the creation of positive particles and the other favoring negative virtual particles, and that an asymmetric magnetic field would then operate on these particles, drawing the axis of the ellipsoidal field out of the plane of rotation. If the previous theory is true, we will have a viable mechanism of interstellar propulsion that violates the major conservation laws, linear momentum as well as energy conservation, because we could have uniform acceleration with a constant power output without the expulsion of any propellant in the opposite direction. We can also cause the craft to move in a direction other than along the axis of rotation of the wheel by alternating the deflection of the ellipsoidal fields on one side of the craft. This will cause a net vector in the direction of the side not so deflected. To protect the occupants against inertial damage and to move the air to avoid sonic disruptions, a rotation of a particle's inertial field with axis parallel to the direction of motion is proposed. This rotation would be opposite for negative and positive particles. The strategy would then be to rotate a superconducting fluid through extremely thin tubes, then send an electrical current in the opposite direction so that the positive rotations and negative rotations of inertial fields reinforce one another. The purpose of a thin tube is to cause the electron's drift velocity to increase inside of the tube by reducing the possible paths it could follow as a current. This would yield the maximum inertial force field that would throw the occupants in the direction of motion at the same rate as the acceleration of the craft, or at least mitigate the effects of acceleration, making them tolerable and that same field outside of the craft would push the air out of the way, eliminating the sonic boom. The effects of UFOs on water would be accounted for by the same system that throws the occupants in the direction of acceleration. The rotating inertial field could raise a column of water at the same time that the occupants were pushed up. In any case, Raising a column of water works against the direction of the craft's main propulsion system and is an obvious liability to that end. Therefore, we must suppose two distinct systems operating simultaneously, with the craft acceleration overpowering the lesser occupant acceleration. Perhaps both systems could be incorporated into a single rotating superfluid. Directional control can be achieved by making the force at one point on the wheel greater than at some other. The rotating wheel would then be allowed to precess to the desired attitude. The appearance of the plasma glow outside of the craft would be ostensibly a byproduct of the mechanics by which the ring's rotation is increased. 
There are only two general plan forms for this type of device. If one chooses to adopt a form follows function engineering guideline, they may be disc shaped or cigar shaped. For artistic and other functional reasons, deviations from these basic styles are possible. They are simply just a little less efficient. What do they want? I conjecture that they have been around for perhaps half a billion years, at least intermittently, for simple reasons of observation. Our planet is of some interest because it harbors indigenous life forms, though I suspect that it is most certainly not the most interesting place in the galaxy. They will not interfere with the Earth's development because that would not be ethical. Their concern would be for the planet as a whole and not for any transient problems that may presently vex us. From their perspective, there is nothing wrong with the Earth. It is simply progressing down a time-honored, though tortuous, path to full independence. So the primary rule of the universe would apply. If it ain't broke, don't fix it.